Um, so, hello, I'm, I'm Gregor, I'm from the Platypus Society, and I'll be moderating today's uh, workshop with the International Marxist Humanist Organization. And uh, first, to introduce both the speakers, uh, we'll have here on the left, Marilyn Nissen Sabat. Uh, she's a member of the International Marxist Humanist Organization, and she is a professor emeritus at uh, Philosophy at Lewis University, and is a practicing psychotherapist. She has authored Neither Victim Nor Survivor Thinking Toward a New Humanity, published in 2009. In addition to numerous articles and books, chapters in philosophy, psychoanalysis, critical race theory, and feminism. And then on the right, we have uh, Peter Hudis. I hope I didn't mispronounce both of your names. Um, also from the International Marxist Humanist Organization. And he is the author of um, Marx's concept of the alternative to capitalism, which is also here. All the books are here. Um, he edited um, the Marxist Humanist Theory of State Capitalism and co-edited co -edited The Power of Negativity, Selected Writings on the Dialectic and Hegel and Marx by Raya, but you'll have to have help. Dunyevskaya. Dunyevskaya, and the Rosa Luxemburg Reader. His next book will be a study of the work of Franz Fanon, and he's also a general editor of the forthcoming 14-volume collection, The work, Complete Works of Rosa Luxemburg, congratulations. And he teaches philosophy at Oakton Community College. And uh, the format will be that we'll have half an hour of initial remarks by um, the two speakers, followed by an informal discussion round in which you're all uh, welcome to join in. And um, I'll ask the first round of questions uh, if I able to come up with one, and um, so I'll hand over to you now. Okay. Uh, okay um, I'm going to be talking about uh, several writings here, so I'm going to begin by just passing them out. Okay. Um, the first is actually a list of, it's headed books by members of the IMHO IMHO, International Marxist Humanist Organization. I'm not going to talk about this. It's for your information. So I'll just pass it out. You can peruse it. Because uh, writing is a significant aspect of the work that we do. Uh, the second uh, item I'm going to pass out is the newly created constitution of the International Marxist Humanist Organization. This constitution was completed uh, a very short time ago, a uh, couple of months, a month or so, after about eight months of extensive discussion, debate, amendment, and so on and so forth, a very um, concentrated, of course, democratic process in creating a constitution for our organization. And the last item I'm going to pass out is a brief writing by Raya Dunievskaya. It's only about three pages plus a few sentences. It was published in 1960. Uh, two years after the Cuban Revolution. It is about the Cuban Revolu Revolution. It was a reading in our recent and ongoing series of classes on past revolutions, uh, how to understand them, what we can learn from them. And we covered many revolutions, the Paris Commune, the Hungarian Revolution, the Russian Revolution, in this series of classes. We have one left, right, Peter? Yes. And the yeah. last one is on the Arab Spring. Yeah. On the Arab Spring, uh, Wednesday after this coming Wednesday. So this was one of the readings uh, for one of the classes. A short piece by Raya. And I decided to talk about it because it is just such a stellar example of her way of thinking and to understand some of the reasons why we in the IMHO uh, feel very committed to her interpretation of Marxism. 
So I'll be doing a little back and forth. There's not much time, but um, the uh, program for this conference, Utopia and Program, sponsored, of course, by Platypus. In the last uh, sentence of it, I could only read it, it's so teeny, uh, what has the left learned? And what can it yet become? Okay, uh, is the topic be addressed? So I'm going to do kind of back and forth between the Constitution and the piece by Raya, just to generate some thoughts. Okay, the Constitution begins. The international Marxist humanist organization aims to develop and project a viable vision of an alternative to capitalism, a new human society, and can give direction to the, today's freedom struggles. Now let's look at this for a moment. The international. We are an international organization and not in name only. We have members in the following countries. West Africa, Iran, US, Canada, Britain, India, Brazil, and the Netherlands. We have members of our international organization in all of those countries. So we are international, not just in name. Okay, now, we talk, this sentence talks about, aims to develop and predict a viable vision. And vision is to be differentiated from utopia in that sense that I think uh, in uh, the program for this conference by Platypus talks about, you know, exhilarating and unrealistic uses those terms to define or characterize utopian thought. We do not see a vision of an alternative to capitalism in that way. It is a vision indeed that gives, can give direction. So what this means is that anti-capitalism is of course of profound importance, but it's not a direction because as such, it does not enable uh, as such a discussion of what's next after capitalism is dispensed with, which hopefully someday will be, but just to say, and we are all, of course, passionately anti-capitalist, as was Marx, despite that he saw it as a step on the way. Most importantly, he was against it. Uh, that a vision then that can give direction to today's freedom struggles uh, is what Hegelian Marxists call second negation. First you negate capitalism, and then you negate that negation because there must be a positive in the negative. And that's how we see what we're calling in uh, a viable vision or alternative to capitalism. But we're not, you know, totally flying by the seat of our pants here. We place great emphasis, for example, in particular, on the critique of the Gotha program, where Marx delineates some very concrete steps in the development from capitalism to <clears throat> a classless society where, with freely associated labor. So we do look to some very significant writings of Marx on a viable vision that can give direction to our struggles. So then um, the next sentence, the reason I made show, is based on the unique philosophical contributions that guard Marx's humanism since it was founded in the 1950s by Brian Junius-Gaia. And I will turn in a minute to some of the material 
in this document by Raya to give you some insight into uh, the power of her thinking and understanding. We do so by working out a unity of theory and practice, worker and intellectual, and philosophy and organization. And of course, worker and intellectual. Okay. We're talking here about uh, workers in the sense of all those who experience alienation at the point of production, whatever is being produced, whatever, be it uh, machines or be it services. Those are forms of production and we're talking about always focus on alienation at the point of production. And uh, to say worker and intellectual should not be taken as a rigid dichotomy at all. There are worker intellectuals. And one thing I will say about Raya's piece on the Cuban Revolution, uh, which is a critique of Fidelismo through and through and through. And if you turn to the second page, uh, <clears throat> you will find Raya saying in the bold face, which is in the original, I did not add that bold face. Together with world communism, Fidel Castro shared the conception of the backwardness of the masses who had to be led. The state would henceforth give the orders, the workers and peasants would continue to work harder while the leaders continued to lead and set foreign policy. And I think it's important to point out that we in the IMHO feel that the belief in, in one way or another, expression of whether subtle, covert, or explicit, in many forms of the backwardness of the masses is the death knell of all hope for a new society. And that if anyone asked me what, what was one of the most significant factors in the failure of past revolutions, I would say it was unacknowledged or unexpressed, or implicit, or even explicit concept or understanding that the masses are in some way backward and therefore need to be led. So, um, and then we do so by working out a human theory and practice, working intellectual, and philosophy and organization. Now, those of you who have any familiarity with us in our history, Peter will talk a little bit about that. Uh, know that um, we, the IMHO, is very deeply interested in philosophy. We have a philosophical understanding of Marx in the broadest sense. Yes, Hegelian, but philosophical. Hegel was very, very great indeed, and Marx was a Hegelian, but Hegel is not all the philosophy. But we uh, are very philosophical, and we talk about the unity of philosophy and organization. Just for a sense of what that might mean. Uh, of course, as you know, we are and always have been intensely anti-vanguardist. We reject completely vanguardism of any form, okay? And needless to say, we are committed to complete democracy in our organization. And at the end of the Constitution, you will find right there all the rules and regulations for our group that are part of the Constitution. It has a long preamble and then a couple of pages of rules and regulations. And you can 
study that, you know, at your leisure to understand how we understand democratic organization. But what would be an organizing principle, okay? This concerns the issue of um, the, the question of the counter-revolution within the revolution. When Dunievskaya created news and letters organizations initially, way back in the mid-50s, one of the things on her mind, it was not the only thing, but it was certainly one of them, was the question of the counter-revolution within the revolution. And that is one perspective on the Russian Revolution and other revolutions. And she actually discusses this in, or, or rather counters the question, in her piece on the Cuban Revolution. And by the way, when you read this, you will see. It was written in 1960, but <clears throat> uh, the Cuban Revolution was 1958, but two years before that, of course, it was the Sumerian Revolution. And you will hear in this piece, so she does not name the Sumerian Revolution, several phrases that clearly invoke it. For example, workers' council which she mentions and finds to be, to put it mildly, non-existent in Cuba and not in any way a part of the Cuban Revolution. Um, so look at, for example, on the third page of this document and see what Raya has to say here. <clears throat> in other words, her basic view of the Cuban Revolution was that it was statist in nature. And that's unambiguously clear from its entire history. Statist in nature. What is it that impelled such self-imposed blindness to the tragedy of the Cuban Revolution, which still has a chance in 1916 to compel its leaders to follow an independent road? because that was a time when the world was divided into two camps, basically Russia and the United States, Soviet Union and the United States, but Raya found that Castro did not take an independent path, namely he joined the uh, Stalinist camp, okay? What is it that impels such self-imposed blindness to the tragedy of the Cuban Revolution, which still has a chance in 1960 to compel its leaders to follow an independent road? Why should the workers and peasants in Cuba be allowed to think that in the Chinese commune, the Chinese peasants are any less oppressed than the Cubans were by the American plantation owners? Why should the Cuban workers be kept in ignorance of conditions of labor in totalitarian state capitalistic Russia? Why should the Cuban people know that the, commun that the Guantanamo base is a threat to their existence and not know that the Russian tanks rode over the Hungarian freedom fight? I just don't mention that I forgot that there are other ways in which it's recalled in this document. Why should they only know of the discrimination against the Negroes in the South, but not know of the extermination of nationalities opposed to Stalinism. Talk about fair and balanced, right? <laughs> that is something deeply embedded in Dunia's guy's worldview. You don't shove things under the rug. You tell the truth, the whole truth. And she goes on, why should literacy be equated to illiteracy of the realities of a world divided into two and only to nuclear, nuclearly armed powers for, out for conquest of the world? Why not allow your new hero, Castro, 
To know some things about Russia, its cynicism and foreign policy, which might easily result in its dropping of Cuba the minute it could get a quote, peaceful coexistence alliance with America. Why, for that matter, not make yourself aware that this petty bourgeois lawyer, Castro, is just as, as cynical and could as easily slip into alliance with the American State Department if it came to face the only truly independent third force, the masses wishing to mold their own destiny in their own hands, sans Fidel Castro, without Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, and the newly arisen state bureaucracy. And you see here that implicit in this is a notion of the counter-revolution within the revolution. And uh, our perspective in the IMHO is to be ever mindful of this. And I mentioned before the question of philosophy and organization. An organizing principle for us towards which we aspire is to attempt, insofar as possible, to live the values of the revolution now, not later. Now, not later. That means rigorous attention to the way our organization is structured, the way it's functioned, regarding, of course, things like racism, sexism, and so on and so forth, and seeing to it that none of this is put off to a later time or shoved into the rug. Okay. Um, as it has been in so many revolutions. Um, what was her name who wrote the book about the Nicaraguan Re Revolution? Margaret, Margaret Randall. Margaret Randall who was a high person, high in both the Cuban and Nicaraguan Revolution, wrote a book called Gathering Rage, highly recommended, in which she points out that the Nicaraguan Revolution, led by Ortega, and still led by Ortega, Ortega. Yeah, still <laughs> Ortega, told her explicitly Basically, you women will have to wait. That's what they told her, and that's what Gathering Rage is about. And if you read the entirety of our preamble to our Constitution, you will see that that is brought out in the discussion of various positions we have had regarding events, historical events in the last two decades, what positions we have taken and why in that preamble. But you will also see there our commitment to never shoving anything under the rug and trying to live the values that we hope for all humanity insofar as we can through our organization um, one final point, this is the last point I'm going to make, and then Peter can take over. Um, in the Constitution, uh, just a few paragraphs down, the paragraph beginning, we hold. We hold that each generation was, must work out what Marxist Marxism means for today very much part of our perspective, what it means for today, not yesterday, today. As Raya Dunyanskaya, the founder of Marxism wrote, Marx's legacy <coughs> is no mere heirloom, but a live body of ideas and perspectives that is in need of concretization. Every moment of Marx's development, as well as the totality of his words, spells out the need for revolution in permanence as the only possible way to preclude counter-revolutionary forces. 
forces within the revolution. It is the notion of revolution in permanence. That means that once the revolution occurs, however it's going to occur, I'm not uh, laying out any program for that, however it's going to occur, when it occurs, it will be an ongoing movement towards a better future, first of all. That's what revolution and permanence means. And it will be such that it will, insofar as possible, preclude regression in the counter revolutionary sense. This is the absolute challenge to our age. Okay? Can I, can I just say, um, I, we have a sign-up sheet here. If you want more information um, about the classes that we have regularly, both here and in other parts of the country, or if you just want more information about the organization, can you put some new details down there, contact details? Well, thank you, Marilyn. I'll just supplement by saying a, a few words uh, about our organizational history, because we've only been in existence a few years, the International Marxist Humanist Organization. But Marxist humanism has a very long organizational history, as uh, Marilyn indicated, that goes way back before that. So I want to give you an idea of where we're coming from to have a better sense of where we're going to. Uh, first, for anybody who um, is familiar, even in a superficial sense, with the philosophy of Marxist humanism, we just brought a handful of some of the literature we produced over the last few years. Uh, we're rather uh, prodigious in producing ideas, I think. Um, but nevertheless, um, Marxist humanism as a philosophy uh, has always put tremendous emphasis on reconstituting um, the revolutionary dialectic, or uh, restating it for one's own error. Um, and in the work of Dunievskaya, uh, this is seen in a number of discoveries that uh, was involved in her work and also worked out in collaboration with others, um, such as she was the first to translate the early writings, the economic and philosophic manuscripts of Marx into English. She was uh, the first, however, also to argue that the dialectical, Hegelian dialectic was actually not just in 1844, but that capital is Marx's most dialectical work, the one where the Hegelian dialectic is most pronounced. All the way back in the 1950s, she argued that Marx's uh, capital, or Marx's work, does not consist of a critique of private property in the market primarily, but a critique of what she called uh, the value form of labor. In other words, Marxism is not a labor theory of value, she argued in 1948, but a value theory of labor, that is the abstract form that labor takes in modern capitalistic society. And uh, Marxist humanism worked out uh, an effort to reconstitute the depth of Marx's dialectical vision of, um, of uh, critique of capital that had largely been passed over by the superficialities of the second, third, and fourth internationals. But from the very moment of its inception, um, Marxist humanism had an organizational expression. It was not simply a uh, discussion group or an effort to work out ideas in isolation from the real world. And she founded, in the mid-1950s, a Marxist humanist organization called News and Letters Committees. Uh, many of us around this table who are now with the IMHO came out of News and Letters and spent considerable amount of time in that organization before uh, forming this new one. So why did we do so? The first thing to keep in mind is dialectics is one of those words that I really don't like to use that often because although it's a very important concept, it's so misused. Um, but dialectics is not an applied science. We can't apply the Hegelian dialectic or the Marxian dialectic. The dialectic can only be recreated out of a new set of circumstances that confront you because it is a method that is at one with the content of its subject matter. So we're not talking about a formal method here of simply applying conclusions or repeating them. And that applies to what an organization's function is. That is, the function of a Marxist humanist organization, as Marilyn was suggesting, in our view, has always been rooted in the conception of rethinking and reestablishing what does the dialectic mean for today in terms of the specific realities of, your new, of the era you're facing. Uh, Dunievsky, I have put it uh, in, uh, in such terms that as follows, he wrote in a book on Rosa Luxemburg, Marx's body
body of ideas is not an heirloom, but is a live body of ideas in need of concretization, or as it says in our Constitution, uh, we see our task as uh, reconstituting what Marxist Marxism means for today. But that's a tall challenge to recreate the dialectic rather than simply apply it or to repeat conclusions from a bygone era. And our biggest criticism of the left is that it does the latter. Now, Dunyevskaya herself was aware of this problem, of course, and she was aware that I think that the problem could arise even within Marxist humanism. Uh, because near the end of her life, in the 1980s, she spoke about a changed world. This was before the collapse of 1989 and the transformation that that encountered. She died shortly before then. But she spoke about a changed world of retrogression in much of her writings from this period. And um, what she was uh, emphasizing in some of her last writings was the question that there is a new problematic that's not really new, but a problematic that Marxist humanism had not sufficiently grappled with, but which no other left tendency had really touched. And that was really the question, why is it that after 50 years or more of spontaneous struggles that obviously we supported and that we are anti-vanguardist and have always put great emphasis on spontaneous freedom struggles, national movements, feminist movements, anti-racism movements, workers' movements. Why, as she put it, nowhere in sight, not even in telescopic sight, is there an answer to the question, what happens after the revolution? Because if you think the answer is, well, we abolish private property and nationalize, uh, get rid of the market, that's obviously not an answer that's even worth discussing at this point. Why, is not, why did nothing come in terms of an answer to that question after all these struggles? What she argued was that we have to posit this question of an alternative to capitalism about our central philosophical task as what the organization would be devoted to. At least that's how we understood uh, where Marxist humanism had to be headed. In the years after Dunyevskaya's death in the 1990s and the early 2000s, uh, we were then part of News and Letters Committees, the group that she had founded in the mid-50s, worked very with great rigor to try to raise and try to dig into new sources of working out this problem. Part of this discussion is found in my book, Marx's Concept of the Alternative to Capitalism, but there's a lot of other aspects of this discussion that um, we're continuing to work out today that certainly is not concluded there. But what we ran into was a problem. What we discovered was the same thing that we had very often criticized much of the rest of the left, we encountered increasingly in our comrades in NNL, a tendency to reduce ideas to following conclusions rather than working them out creatively in terms of this specific question, what happens after? That is, to bring our philosophic resources to bear on the question of what is a genuine alternative to capitalism uh, rooted in Marx that uh, would speak to the realities of our day. We ran into many in our organization that were in news and letters at the time that were very resistant to carry on that discussion. Uh, for various reasons, sometimes on the grounds that uh, it's a new discussion that they're not prepared for, or that it, does this involve a utopian project that imposes a program upon the masses in some form down the road, to borrow the platypus title of this conference. Um, we argued to the contrary against it, but we found a rigidity uh, among some in news and letters. Uh, a battle of ideas broke out in our organization as to how to take this discussion further. And uh, we were put in a position, at least a large percentage of the people in the organization, uh, that we could not continue in the group uh, because they did not want to carry forward this new line of uh, investigation in the way that, uh, at all, frankly, let alone the way we wanted it to proceed. So we had to break away and form a new group called the International Marxist Humanist Organization, which, in sum, to us, means that we are very devoted not to repeat the mistakes that we felt news and letters fell into, which is repeating the ideas of Donetsky without creatively redeveloping them for your error. Any body of ideas, even the greatest, can be turned into a dogma or an ideology. There is nothing that stops that from happening. The only thing that stops that from happening is actually becoming a dialectician and rising to the challenge to expose yourself to error and mistake and trying to work out the ideas anew. This is what we're trying to do in the organizational forum that we've created as an international grouping uh, spanning uh, several different continents.
Um, I'm sorry about this. I'm going to shut this. Uh, just to get the discussion going, I think I've got a two-part question, um, and it relates to what you just said, Peter. Um, I'm really interested in if you could um, explain more the humanist part of the organization's name in, in, in a way, um, um, because particularly humanism in, in the left has uh, got, uh, gotten an attack really starting with the 70s. Um, so um, how you respond to such uh, controversies and what the humanism means in your name and the second part of my question is, I want to play devil, devil's advocate for a second and um, separate uh, the term backwardness of the masses from who had to be led. In that um, every revolution in a, uh, can encounter a counter revolution. And um, Cuba was just off the coast of the United States. Um, in that there obviously seems to be a need to find at least some friends and allies that could protect you against invasion. Um, firstly, secondly, the leading that can that can be expressed by the masses themselves as a realization of democracy. Um, so I'm just throwing this classically Leninist argument at you, and I, I wonder what you have to say about that, and then we can open the floor for discussion. Uh. This point is addressed to some extent in the Constitution itself, uh, in the paragraph uh, beginning in contrast, tendencies such as postmodernist thought. Now, postmodernist thought is the home of virtually all anti humanist tendencies in contemporary thought. Postmodernism is where it comes from. Contrast tendencies such as postmodernist thought and pragmatism, <clears throat> also an anti humanist perspective, which reject a unifying philosophy. So, humanism, as it was for Marx, is for us a unifying philosophy. In other words, it's about what it is to be a human being, how shall we live, and what sort of work shall we do. That is humanism. Uh, which rejects the human philosophy, cannot fundamentally challenge the realities of globalized capitalism, namely postmodern tendencies, with no unifying theme other than anti-humanism, because you can say that that is the unifying theme of all thought deriving from, devolving from post-modernist uh, post thought. But an adequate response to these alternatives cannot be based on forms of post-Marx Marxism that allow particularity and difference to be skipped over or ignored. We do not skip over or ignore difference, in other words, that we have a unifying philosophy, that Marx had a unifying philosophy, uh, does not mean that particularity and difference are ignored, suppressed, or anything horrible like that. New human relations, what Marx articulated in 1844 as a thoroughgoing naturalism or humanism, quote from Marx, of course, thoroughgoing naturalism or humanism, because for Marx, we are human beings, part of nature. Although, of course, he did not view human beings as objects. Can be achieved when we restate, develop, and concretize Marxist Marxism for our time as a dialectical, critical concept for revolution. So, uh, you know, humanism, is Marx's starting point. It is his starting point. Without it, one cannot even begin to think about what Marxism is. And so, uh, I would put it this way. Postmodernism set up humanism as a straw man 
the conception of humanism that they project is false, and then they proceed to demolish it without ever understanding that humanism is not an ideology, a closed system of thought, or anything alien to uh, revolutionary thought. Just to add a few words to that, just very briefly. I would put it this way. We call ourselves humanists because without acknowledging and restating the humanist dimension of Marx, his critique of capital is incoherent. I know that's a claim that would need some justification, but that's what I would look for. Why is that? Marx's critique of capital is not about the free market, free or unfree. It's not about the existence or non-existence of private property, though he's against both the market and private property. We're not market socialists, uh, nor are we for private property. But that's not the object of his critique. The object of Marx's critique is the transformation of human relations into relations between things. To the extent that Marx calls capital the subject in capital, which is only in a provisional sense he does so, uh, because he only says that in the discussion on the process of circulation, uh, but insofar as capital is the subject, that is what it tells us, that human relations take on the form of relations between things. We become dominated by the creations of our own hand, and, humani and the, the humanity of the individual is subsumed and destroyed by being subjected to this abstract process of domination, capital that grows big with value. So if you take the humanism out of Marx, what are you left with? You're left with, uh, I think, an impoverished view of Marx's critique of capital. Um, you're also left with an impoverished view of efforts to get out from under the domination of capital, in my view. Because if we careful, carefully study those rare moments where revolutionary turning points occurred in the in history of the past century, we'll discover that in the vast majority of them, the revolutions were directed precisely against, in their original motivation, the transformation of human relations into relations between things. That is, the effort to challenge the alienation, not simply the alienation of the product from the producer, uh, which uh, is, again, not the object of Marx's critique, but the alienation from the very activity of living and laboring itself, which is the object very much of his critique. And the battle against that type of alienation posits humanistic forms of self-expression. So uh, it's in this sense that we're not humanitarians. We're not the kind of humanism that's the sloppy kind of, oh, let's, uh, let's all be nice and get along. There's not Bananda Shiva or something. Uh, <laughs> what we're talking about is um, the kind of humanism that is rooted in a revolutionary critique of capital. Lastly, on your point about Cuba, well, of course, you can always make the argument that they had to do, they had to, Castro had to line up with the Soviets, otherwise the U.S. would have gotten him. But you know, you can actually make that argument for any society on a certain level. I mean, England had to engage in the enclosures because otherwise it would have fallen behind in the race for industrial production with France and they would have lost out to France. Or the Soviet Union had to have uh, done what they did uh, on a much more egregious level uh, with the forced industrialization under Stalin because otherwise they wouldn't have been able to beat Hitler. How would they build a T-34 tank if they hadn't demolished all those peasants and concentrated capital in a few hands, etc., etc.? <coughs> Once one puts oneself in that slippery slope, one is basically turning uh, revolution and politics into a mere matter of capitalist uh, diplomacy and contingencies. As Lenin once said himself, he was ready at one point to sacrifice the Russian Revolution for the sake of the Chinese Revolution, right? He said, if, if, it, if we have to go under in order to provide for the possibility of a future revolution that would not besmirch the name of revolution, he was willing to do that. Unfortunately, maybe he didn't live up to that standard himself and support some of what he did. But um, I think it's more important to raise a banner and to put forth a perspective, even if the perspective has no possibility of success at the historical junction you're in. Because what you end up having if you do otherwise is what's happened to us the last 50 years. Stalinism has done more to, dis to discredit the idea of socialism than anything the capitalists could ever invent. <laughs> and you set back the cause of socialism decades, if not centuries, by identifying it with state domination and uh, kind of society that uh, we ended up with in the so-called social states.
right, because if we started a little late, I think we can stretch our time as best as we possibly can to make room for the next panel. So I guess we, should, we could have this conversation until 11.20. If that's, if, that's, if that's okay. So, are there any questions? Uh, Pam? I think I will follow up with a question about the humanist part of the Marxist humanism. So, from what you said, I'm sorry, and I can't remember your name. Marilyn. Marilyn, what Marilyn and Peter have said. Um, there seems to be an emphasis on a unifying philosophy, as in all of human relations. So. The critique of postmodernism that you're putting forth is that it basically challenges this perspective that there can be such a thing as a unifying philosophy, and so does pragmatism. So humanism is like an emphasis on that. Like I would put it in terms of a totality, like what it means to sort of posit something as a totality. Um, and but then Peter, you added that it's also about challenging the form of alienation in capitalism. That it's about a kind of maybe you wouldn't put it in terms of a restoration, but raising the issue of like the human like aspect of society. But I wanted to ask, you know, it, it seems to me and Marx, and this might be familiar to those of us who've done the reading group in Platypus, we read Lukacs and the reification essay specifically, in which he talks about, it seems to me, this emancipatory potential of the objectification of social activity. And insofar as what it's allowing for is a kind of distance from the processes of you know, the reproduction of society in order to potentially transform it. So that there is a standpoint from which, because the relation between peoples can be understood as a relationship between things, then one can then comprehend it and then potentially change it. And so in, in that statement, it seems to me that the, the humanist part of it, like of that statement, if I were to put it that way, is the possibility of transforming the nature of what is human. That insofar as alienation is a problem in capitalism, it actually doesn't allow for those transformative capacities to be wielded by human beings for their ends. So it's not so much that the objectification itself is only a problem, but it's also like the very conditions under which a transformation towards freedom can happen. I wonder what you thought about that formulation. First of all, you know, I haven't looked at Lukács for a long time, so I'm not sure what you said about this. But in philosophy, it's profoundly important to understand that objectification is not a synonym for reification. Mm -hmm. objectification in the sense of establishing a distance from whatever things or events or processes to enable comprehension and critical appraisal mm -hmm. is not reification. I think for Lukács, objectification or reification is an alienated form of objectification. Yeah. But he does say in his uh, 71 afterwards, history and class consciousness, that he slipped into an idealistic mystification in history and class consciousness in equating You mean two. when he became a Stalinist and realized No, no, point. not in 71. He was, this is after he had broken from Stalinism 15 years earlier in 56. Uh, we think history and class consciousness is a great book, by the way. The reification essay is a magnificent step forward in Marxism. Mm -hmm. But it has its problems. The notion of the proletariat as a unified subject object is not something we accept. We think that was also an idealistic mystification in his part. The notion of, and Lukács himself recognized that he, the difference between objectification and objectivization, something that Karol Kosick discusses magnificently in his critique of Lukács in Dialectics of the Concrete. Mm -hmm. is something I think Lukács himself realized there was a problem there in his later work. So Lukács, for all of his great greatness, in other words, um, neither, in, neither in the reification essay mm -hmm. nor where he actually does, because of course the amazing thing about the reification essay is written before the manuscript, 1844 manuscripts were available. So mm -hmm. how does he even know that Marx was dealing with these things? It's quite brilliant for him to get to that. Mm -hmm. But when he writes to young Hegel, he has the 1844 manuscripts in front of him, of course, and he's commenting directly upon it. It's very curious if you look at the young Hegel. Now, that is the Stalinist period. Mm -hmm. 
actually the last chapter, you know, has a book praise to Stalin. But that aside, it's, it's a valuable book, I mean, in terms of its theoretical study. You notice that Lukash nowhere singles out, quotes everything from the 1844 manuscripts except Marx's statement, two, Mar two Marx's statements. One, where he says, speaks for positive humanism beginning from itself, that's an affirmative. And second, when Marx says, my philosophy is neither an idealism nor a materialism, but the truth is the uniting truth them uniting them both. Mm -hmm. That was beyond Lukács' purview. I think what Peter just said is extremely important, but it's also important to understand that phenomenologically speaking, in terms of, of human concrete existence, the world is experienced by us as German has a term for it, Gegenstandlichkeit as over and against us. That is the um, uh, ineliminable dimension of being human, being a subject for whom the world is as object in the non-reified sense, and at the very same time, an object in the non-reified sense in the world. We are both subject to who the world is and object in the world. And this is a very uh, description of experience as such. So that, that there are objects is not an alienating phenomenon, but a dimension of what it is to be human. Let me just now, in terms of, a, yeah. excuse me, uh, just one more point about unifying mm -hmm. your first point. It does not follow that a unifying philosophy is a closed philosophy. That this again is the way in which, in my opinion, postmodern thought poisoned our language. Unity is not necessarily closedness and does not necessarily exclude diversity. My background is philosophy, my PhD in philosophy from before university where I studied phenomenology. I was had the good fortune to be able to do that there many years ago. The ancient question of the one and the many is always being reborn in different ways, in different centuries, in different modes of thought. But uh, unity is not inherently exclusionary. In fact, I would argue that it's a precondition for the possibility of diversity, because diversity cannot exist in a vacuum. It must, as diversity, be contained in a whole. I wanted to just go back to the question, though. Um, I use Lukács, but I want to make sure that the questions are, I don't disagree with anything that you said about unification of the unifying philosophy. Right? I think that, in fact, that's it's a very deep problem of our time, like postmodernism. But anyway, um, I was more interested in the subject-object relation that you talked about, that that kind of experience of society and oneself in society, that relationship between the particular and the universal. Um, in Lukács, it seems to me, I, mean, I, I almost want to leave him out of it, but I'm, I'm using Lukács okay. to articulate it, so um, that this is the very basis on which the transformation of society can happen within capitalism, that subject-object relation, and yet, in capitalism, the subject-object relation is definitely marked by the experience of alienation as a historical problem. So the alienated subject-object relations for Lukács have a name that's called reification. But so it seems to me that what he's saying, though, is that that reification in, it, in, in its appearance already affirms a possibility. That is, that there is this objective dimension, there's this objective experience of society um, within capitalism, a specific subject-object relation within capitalism, 
that it is the very grounds on which, the very conditions on which one can make claims about the transformation of what is human. Yeah. And in that sense, it's not an affirmation of humanity, but rather affirming the possibility of the transformation of humanity. Yes, I guess if I can yes. really reformulate that. that, maybe it's, maybe, um, I'll just to add to this, that it's not really about abolishing capitalism per se, but realizing it mm -hmm. in the sense of in realizing bourgeois society in the way that itself, it itself never could, but on the very basis, we are able to formulate visions of socialism and communism. Is that fair? Yeah, in, in this transformation, the certain possibilities have become available. Well, there's not, there's not anything particularly uh, controversial about the claim uh, that you're presenting from Lukács. It's, Marx puts it when he says that humanity had to be reduced to this utter depravity in order to find its way to its true essence. It's a great quote from Marx directly, right? In other words, that it's precisely by losing ourselves through reification that humanity comes to an awareness of what it has lost and therefore can for the first time gain it. So this is one of the reasons why Marx did of course hold that it would be uh, inconceivable to think that the concept of socialism could arise previous to the emergence of capitalism. That's not the same thing as saying, however, that socialism is the realization of capitalism, nor is it the same thing as saying that no society could achieve socialism without first experiencing stages of capitalistic industrialization, because Marx himself, as Kevin Anderson, I think, demonstrates rather well in his uh, book on Marx in the Margin, especially in the last 15, 20 years of his life, argued decisively against that very position when he argued for the possibility of non-capitalist societies to get to communism uh, without going through the stage of capitalist reification, uh, as long as certain conditions were met. So I don't see the socialist project as a realization. I do see it as uh, an Aufhebung, mm -hmm. but not. I wouldn't say simply as the carrying further of the bourgeois project. Uh, the Aufhebung, of course, has uh, preservation, but also the negation. Uh, and that's it's, it's a fundamental split. And one of the real problems of post-Marx Marxism, in our view, is a failure to appreciate the extent of the break that Marx envisioned between capitalism and what is to come after it. From the first moment of a post-capitalist society, Marx makes clear, as Marilyn mentioned in the critique of the Gotha program, there is no value production, Marx says. There is no exchange of products in the lower phase of communism. A very sharp break emerges from the very moment um, of the emergence of a new society. We can't call anything socialistic even that doesn't measure up to that kind of standard. to add something go, go briefly, sorry. I would characterize the subject after relation that obtains now as a subject object split. In other words, precisely that human beings in capitalism do not experience the world as one which we make, which we through our working with it in the course of our existence. Rather, there's a complete splitting. And this has to do with the role of scientism in capitalist ideology. So it's a split. And rather than uh, it being something that could be worked with to go beyond capitalism is something that must be abolished. I guess so. I'm, I'm tempted to put a little more of a political uh, point on this, um, especially thinking about the masses and the idea of the masses as an independent third force. And I'm sure that you'll correct me, but it seems that the one plausible claim, actually, that we might make about the masses is that their demand is to participate in bourgeois society. We see this in every election cycle in terms of the demand for jobs and employment. Um, I think we see this throughout the world uh, as well. You know, if you want to talk about slum cities and the way that um, that problem could plausibly 
sort of be addressed going forward. And it's, it, one point that I'm hearing raised is that, uh, is that a, a reconstituted left in the future might seek to meet that demand um, that might actually entail the overcoming, the abolition of the value form would actually be its, its fulfillment uh, on a kind of universal basis. Um, so I'm wondering what you all think about that. And would that sort of merely be the kind of unhelpful uh, reconstitution of capital? Or do you think that in order to sort of overcome capital, it would have to be universalized in that, in that sense? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, I, I'm a little uncomfortable just the way you opened the discussion, but it's not a substantial objection to what you're saying or anything, but uh, talking about the masses as they, and it, it becomes, it become, yes, it becomes a, a, a problematical way of perhaps formulating it, but the gist of what, the spirit of what you were saying is, is, is I, uh, well taken. Um, but I, my take is on this. Certainly, certainly many struggles take the form of demanding bourgeois rights in one form or another, especially in the last several decades. Um, as Marx put it, the course of self-estrangement proceeds through the course of self-estrangement itself. This is understandable, and this is uh, not to be too surprising. Of course, the biggest problem is how do you not get caught in that process and get stuck in uh, this stage of a mere valorization of bourgeois right. I think it's extraordinarily important, given the historical period that we have now been in for the last 40 years, where we have seen um, a tremendous historical retrogression, not only in the left, but in uh, terms of the character of many revolutions that have emerged. I'm talking about like 89 in East Europe. Uh, I'm talking about, uh, we can talk about the People's Revolution in the Philippines. Uh, all of them have had this character that you're describing to a large extent. But I think it's very important not to allow our theoretical horizon to be defined by what, frankly, are standpoints that inevitably lead to defeat. Because these efforts to posit bourgeois right, bourgeois rights, while, of course, they have to be supported, one wants to get rid of a dictatorship and have parliamentary elections, it's certainly an improvement, et cetera, et cetera. Insofar as those revolutions did not have an, an economic, did not direct themselves to a critique of the economic content of the society, did not call into the question class relations, did not call into question the whole structure of alienation, as earlier revolutions did, and as other revolutions might in the foreseeable future, we ourselves trap our own mind into, uh, uh, we allow our own mind to be stamped by the limitations of, of a particular peculiar historical era. So that's why I would not view that uh, the transcendence of value can only occur through the realization of value. The realization of value is essentially the elimination of the ecological, of, of the, of the ecological existence of this planet, frankly. I mean, uh, th there's no, th there's, uh, I don't know of what superstition of value will occur if value completely conquers everything and uh, uh, reigns triumphant for the next generations. We're already at a tipping point in terms of the ability of this planet to sustain itself. So it's in that sense that I think um, we have to, as Marxist humanists, we try to focus on the historical high points that point us beyond bourgeois right without neglecting the need at various moments to join in those battles and raise those demands to try to push the movement further in relationship to the kind of demands that came from those earlier high points. And the Hungarian Revolution is one of those high points that Marilyn mentioned that we uh, point out that was looking way beyond bourgeois right. Those are the workers' councils trying to reorganize production from the bottom up. And uh, one cannot overestimate the degree to which the whole question of workplace democracy, workers' council, etc., is being suppressed in idea production in the world today. <clears throat> I just read a book called An Ethics of Improvisation. This book is a powerful argument for participatory democracy which the author sees exemplified 
in free jazz, improvisational jazz. And her depiction of this is magnificent, detailed, beautiful, psychosocial, historical, uh, aesthetic, and so on and so forth. Never once in the book does she mention the relevance of, say, participatory democracy in the radical sense to workplace democracy, to the experiences of human beings in the labor and work that they do. The most extreme uh, exemplification of the tyranny of capitalism is the fact that no worker today has freedom of thought and expression. It does not exist in the workplace. And that is, that is the, the, the uh, horror, the unspoken horror at the heart of the bourgeois world. Um. <coughs> I'm not really sure when Peter made sort of a dismissive comment about um, market socialism, but I would suggest that there are a number of aspects of worker democracy that are not just theoretical, but that are taking place. I would begin, of course, with Mondragon, um, but not too long ago, I was in Argentina, and I don't know if anybody's familiar with Marriott Citroen's book, uh, Horizontalism, about what happened with the factory takeovers. And the factories are still running. And in fact, the hotel that they took over, the Hotel Bowen, there was a huge critical theory conference that I was at, of course. And so I think that one of the things that doesn't get make the headlines in the New York Times is the growing number of worker-owned, employee-owned stock programs, et cetera, et cetera, that is a growing phenomenon that is a way of overcoming the problems that I think we all agree upon, beginning with exploitation and ending with, well, I don't know what it ends with, the destruction of the planet, but Peter, he's probably right. Uh, but, it, but there are a number of, of efforts going on at worker democracy, workplace ownership, common ownership of the workplace. And this is a very, very growing movement that gets much less attention than I think it should deserve. Okay, just one more on that. Um, which you reminded me of, it also relates back to back to your question. It's not just a historical question when I say not being, not allowing your own theoretical standpoint to be stamped by the defeats of the last decades or, or the phenomenal form in which these movements have taken. Um, because there's always more going on below the surface, at least sometimes there is. I mean, you can read the Arab Spring, for instance, as a battle between those who uh, wanted to an expanded bourgeois democracy and Islamic fundamentalists, with the Islamic fundamentalists winning out. And that could be the narrative, and you can say, well, that is basically all that's going on. If you say that, I think you haven't studied the Arab Spring very carefully. But because there clearly was, even though it's, a, it's under the surface and it's a minoritarian tendency, there's clearly a dimension of working class mobilization that was part of the Arab Spring, even if it was somewhat ephemeral, but there was clearly working class mobilization in parts of Egypt that was challenging neoliberalism and not stopping at, at demands for bourgeois democracy. And we can even see it here in a sense because the Wisconsin labor battles, which were a defeat, of course, ultimately, you can say, because Scott Walker won his thing, right? But that was framed within a very narrow bourgeois legal context, right? That entire struggle that brought out 100,000 people. So it would be very easy to say, well, here we have confirmation that there's not much to talk about in terms of the working class in America. But what really brought out what I noticed, a lot of people to those protests was not the issue of wages and benefits, or et cetera, et cetera. What brought them out was the elimination of collective bargaining over working conditions. And that is an implicitly revolutionary demand and, and uh, concern, which, of course, got completely submerged by the re in the recall campaign. Um, but that doesn't mean that that uh, element was not there trying to bubble to the surface. So that needs somewhat theoretical thought articulation um, if we're going to do our justice to the events that uh, we're uh, witnessing. Before I give over to you, yeah. Ken, are there any other questions from people who haven't had the chance to talk yet? If not, I'll give over to you. Okay. 
I just wanted to go back to the statement that this thread sort of came out of when you were talking about the, we look rather to the historical high points that push beyond bourgeois right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you mentioned like so the, the councils under Hungary and, um, and then you continue to talk about them also that within the Arab Spring there was there were workers' organizations, et cetera. I think that's right, but I think that if you're gonna talk about historical high points of pushing beyond bourgeois right, then that criteria for you know how we adjudicate that has to do with historical possibility as well. The pushing beyond bourgeois right is not simply because workers have been able to organize. But rather also talks, it, I think that it also has to speak to the conditions of possibility for that form of organization to push beyond the present. I, in case of the Arab Spring, you know, I, it's kind of like a fact that workers were in fact like organizing, they were part of the mobilization. But when you think about the present and the conditions for those types of movements being successful, I, I don't think that one can think about the Arab Spring as pushing beyond bourgeois right. I, I, I don't think that it will, like, you know, for the left go down as a kind of historical high point of that. So I guess maybe just to, like, make it more of an open question, like, what are these moments, like, that push beyond bourgeois right? And, like, you know, what's the content of that? Because I, I, m my, m my mind sort of goes into the fact that, like, things like Soviet, councils, like these, these workers' councils, the Soviets, like, I think did push beyond bourgeois right, but only to the extent that they were happening within the context of an attempt at an international revolution. And so it's, and it's both, right? It's not just like one or the other. It's not that the fact that like people are in fact like trying to figure out how is it that you mobilize like an international workers' movement, but it's also the fact there, that there are these councils, that they are in fact an attempt at least to democratize the production. And so it's they're working sort of you know together. I don't know if you guys were at the um, panel last night, but actually James Turley made a, a similar point to the comrade in Syriza uh, when he said that you know it seems that you know here we have this desire for the transformation of society, but what's missing is the kind of historical possibility. And how do you make sense of that? You know what what does it mean? So okay, so the question here being what is the content of this? high points, historical ha high points of pointing beyond bourgeois rights. Like, what does that mean? Yeah, good question, uh, Pam. I would just briefly, it's a longer discussion, obviously, we'd have to have on this. <laughs> but um, I, I would say that, uh, first of all, there are many times where you have a Soviet type of worker self, effort to achieve worker self-organization beyond the parameter of bourgeois right emerges. That's not at the moment of the possibility, or at least in the context of, a, of an international mobilization for that kind of perspective. Paris Commune is one example, Hungarian Revolution is another, which was not at that moment. The Russian Revolution, you could say, arguably was, and the Bolsheviks actually hoped that it was. It would, they hoped that it was. But it didn't turn out to be. The West European revolutions didn't succeed, and they don't just simply succeed uh, and for complex reasons, we can go into this. My book on Moritz Luxemburg tries to address some of this. But um, it's not so clear that there were the conditions for the possibility of the realization of an international workers' revolution in 1917. And yet that, that did not stop the emergence of the Soviets, not once but twice in 1905 and 1917. And it didn't stop that idea from galvanizing tens of millions of people around the world and gave rise to a whole uh, what we know as 20th century Marxism, for better or for worse. So it's not so clear to me that the international context has to be right for this kind of contestation to make an impact. Although, of course, we have, I agree with you 100%, it's not going to succeed ultimately without that context. Just before I give over to Nikos, uh, I, I have to think that you, in a way, are then advocating socialism in one country. Then. No, of course and, and not. After 1917, after the failure of the international no. revolution, they should have tried to implement actual socialism. No, no, no. It's, it's absurd. No. Nothing further from what I'm saying. Absolutely not. You can't have socialism in one country, which everything that we've ever written argues this very strongly. Uh, 
uh, the problem in Russia was once the West European revolutions clearly did not succeed, there was no hope for, for, for Russia at all. The problem is, uh, what do you do then if you're Lenin sitting in Moscow? Mm -hmm. Right? Do you then say, okay, we give up and we let the whites, counter-revolutionaries, uh, slaughter us all? Mm -hmm. Or do we try to hold off for more time? And how do you do that, uh, given this, uh, this uh, uh, international situation? So what does Lenin do? He does what Rosa Luxemburg criticized him for doing, make a virtue out of necessity. Um, instead of simply saying we have, to, we have to do this or that as a temporary holding pattern, with the that is the, the setting up the Cheka, uh, single party state, banning left publications, creating a single party, a quasi totalitarian state, uh, which of course Stalin, of course, takes in a very different and much more severe direction. Instead, saying that this is a temporary measure, it becomes this is the measure that is the right one to take. You make a virtue out of necessity. And then all the Leninists that come after you take that limitation as the point of departure to proceed from, which is socialism in one country. Not that Lenin advocated that. Mm -hmm. So what we're saying is a complete opposite of socialism in one country. Mm -hmm. It goes back to the whole question that Marilyn was raising on Cuba in my response to your question on Cuba. What do you do when you can't, even if it were true that there was no way for Castro in 59, 60 to have that revolution succeed given the power of US imperialism? Well. That's, again, Lenin addressed that, and there were some moments where he was good on that, where he said, sometimes it's better to raise the banner and then go down, and then hope that the banner gets raised again at the next opportune generation, rather than besmirching the idea of socialism itself. I, I would say that the very notion of, there's some indication that the very notion of bourgeois right is in flux today. Why ha is the radical right in this country so determined to shove their views of social issues down the throats of every American? Is complete LGBT equality a bourgeois right as such? The bourgeois worldview has existed for a very long time while denying that possibility. Uh, uh, all these issues of abortion, of uh, race equality, of self-determination of African Americans in this country, and so on and so forth, they are fighting to the death to prevent from occurring. If they're just bourgeois rights, why are they so desperate to prevent it? Because once these things get into place, and people begin to feel that there's no restrictions, unjust, unfair restrictions on their rights. Where will they go next? All right, we've got time for one last question. Um, so please keep it short as best as possible and also your response. Because we'll have to get out of this My question is a bit uh, different. Uh, you seem to emphasize the importance uh, of uh, dialect dialectics as a philosophy background, and uh, also the need to live the values of the revolution now and here. Uh, do you think that uh, international Marxist humanist organization should base um, its dialectical conception on today's struggles such as Arab Spring or um, anti-war movement, etc., as a way to live the values of the revolution here and now? I mean, certainly, uh, we were very active in the anti-war movement around the time of the invasion of Iraq, of course. I mean, certainly, to participate in the anti-war movement is... But how does, that, does this uh, relate to the dialectical conception? Well, if you, I would hope that we have a couple of pamphlets that we've issued, as well as some of our books, uh, of, of some of our more you know shorter work, that uh, uh, deal with uh, an issue. And I think people in Platypus would find a resonance uh, because we've been rather um, distinctive in the left as for our critique of counter-revolutionary anti-imperialism. Uh, that 
Bill knows, and we've been very critical of aspects of the anti-war movement for lining up with any force, no matter how reactionary, so long as it uh, is anti-American, not even really anti-imperialist. Um, so yes, we're engaged, we, I've been long engaged in the anti-war movements going back to the Iraq War of 2003 and before, but we've been uh, on the margin of that movement in the sense of uh, issuing some very sharp critiques of some of the presuppositions of that movement, especially in our critique of political Islam and uh, Islamism and the way that many have uh, uh, acted as if, if not treating it as a progressive force, treating it as uh, not the pro what, something that should not be as equal an object of critique as imperialism itself. So while we support the general aims, such as U.S. out of Iraq, we don't just go to a rally and say, U.S. out of Iraq. I mean, we don't see that as, the, I, I'd rather stay home uh, if that's what we're going to do. Uh, we go to say, uh, what's, yes, U.S. out of Iraq, and what's wrong with the, the way this uh, perspective is being raised in this movement at this moment? And we've been having that fight now for 15 years. All right, thank you very much. I hope that we can see each other at all and later panels. Yes. Thank you, Peter and Marilyn. Thank you very much, Dan and Greg. Uh, I didn't have a chance to read it yet. There's a contact list. Just go around once and it's going around again. Awesome. If you want to sign up for more information or information about our classes. Yeah, you did. I didn't read it. Thank you. 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 Thank